In the previous lecture, we looked at uh, dementia as a general construct and the commonalities that all the dementias um, share. And we looked at various uh, clinical testing instruments, neuropsychological assessment instruments that can be used to measure various forms of memory and cognitive impairment. So with that covered, we now need to uh, take a look at the different types of uh, dementia that can present themselves. And that's what we have listed on the slide in front of us now. Alzheimer's disease, as we're going to spend a significant uh, time addressing, um, is thought to account for about 70% of the dementias that are out there. Now, this number, 70%, is kind of a loosey-goosey number. Various sources you go to, you'll see lower values. You'll see them as high as 80%, et cetera. Uh, so, you know, this is not a number to bet your life on, so to speak. It's a very, very rough guesstimate of what the proportion of the dementias fall into one particular category, in this case, Alzheimer's disease. Vascular, de uh, vascular dementia is another form of uh, dementia. That 10% figure is a little bit more uh, reliable. So about one in 10 uh, dementias are due to a vascular uh, mechanism that is uh, age-related diseases of uh, the uh, arteries that supply the blood, the nutrients to the brain. Uh, those shut down and the brain begins to die. But there's many other, uh, if you will, less frequent forms of dementia that we're beginning to learn about and being able to classify. And those are about 11% of the dementias are believed to fall into those categories. And some of the names of those dementias are Lewy body dementias, frontotemporal lobe dementias. Parkinson's disease can often progress into dementia, normal pressure, hydrocephalus uh, can occur when the sinuses uh, in the brain begin to expand and, and essentially destroy the, the cortical tissue. And uh, we can't forget that uh, this last category down here, that there are that about 9% of the dementia uh, syndromes that present themselves are not due to uh, you know, one of these chronic diseases that are incurable and uh, destroy your brain tissue and ultimately lead to death. Instead, there are many conditions that can mimic uh, uh, dementia sym uh, symptoms. And that's what we need to consider in the next slide. And that is um, one of the first things that uh, geriatricians are taught is what, that when people present with dementia type syndromes, the first thing you have to do is rule out reversible conditions. That is, conditions that aren't due to permanent death of brain cells like Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia and some of those other dementias I showed you on the previous slides, but if you will, acute conditions that are potentially reversible. And it's important to identify those up front, not only so that you don't get a misclassification, but many of these disorders that they're not diagnosed and treated in a timely fashion can lead to permanent damage of the brain. So uh, typically these uh, alternatives ha are ruled out by examinations, uh, physical examinations of the individual, and then various lab tests, uh, usually blood tests, uh, et cetera, uh, and maybe even some, if you will, imaging uh, studies of their brain to rule out the uh, many of these mimics that can present with, uh, if you will, dementia uh, symptoms. And I just have listed just a few of them uh, on this slide to give you some ideas. You know, uh, there are many, many, many uh, conditions that can cause, uh, if you will, dementia type uh, symptoms. And one of the things I actually don't have listed here uh, that I should is uh, psychotic depression really advanced the depression in uh, geriatric patients can really uh, present just like a dementia and that has to definitely be ruled out before um, the uh, diagnostic process uh, can proceed to a conclusion that there is a chronic dementia present.
So with uh, that covered, what we're going to do now is we're going to take an in-depth look at vascular dementia. And then following that, we will take an in-depth look at uh, the most common variant of dementia, namely Alzheimer's disease. So let's uh, start with our exploration of what vascular dementia is all about. Like all the dementias that we saw earlier, uh, in order to make a diagnosis of vascular dementia, we need to show positive signs of memory impairment, uh, one or more cognitive impairments like aphasia, apraxia, agnosia, executive function that we looked at in detail in an earlier lecture. And we also need to establish that those two impairments, the memory impairment and the cognitive uh, ca uh, categories of impairment, significantly affect social or occupational function. And then over and above those uh, essentially demonstrations, that is some, that someone is demented, in order to make a vascular diagnosis, we need to now document positive signs that there are cerebrovascular disease present. And we'll see how uh, clinicians will go about doing that in the next couple of slides. So some of the ways of getting positive evidence for cerebrovascular involvement include, uh, for example, brain imaging studies doing MRIs or positron emission uh, tomography type studies. And what these studies will show, if indeed these conditions are present, they'll show cortical infarctions, that is areas of the cerebral cortex that have died because their blood supplies have been blocked due to cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, I should say. White matter tract thinning is often a sign of the cerebrovascular problems and focal subcortical lesions that is going below the lesions, seeing problems in areas in particular in the brainstem that might be associated with apraxia that we saw earlier. And uh, in uh, another way of positively documenting uh, uh, the, if you will, effects of cerebrovascular disease on uh, a cognition and memory are through positive neurological indicators. Uh, and uh, those are uh, shown on the remainder of the slide and on the next slide. That is, outcomes that could be diagnosed by a thorough neurological examination by an experienced geriatric neurologist. So one of the things that's a positive sign of vascular dementia is exaggerated deep tendon reflexes. So the neurologist will be, could use a reflex hammer and be looking for tendon reflexes in various uh, parts of the body. And what typically is indicative of a problem here is when you see a very, very exaggerated response, a very strong reflexive response. And those, if you will, exaggerated re re responses, tendon reflex responses, are thought to be due to the fact that there's brainstem damage and that essentially uh, blocks the normal inhib inhibition of those reflexes that occurs in a top-down fashion from the brain. Uh, and then also we can see a, an abnormal uh, extensor plantar response, the so-called Babinski reflex. And that is if you uh, uh, have someone take their shoes and socks off and you sit them on the examination table and on the sole of their foot, you take essentially typically the, uh, you know, the opposite of the reflex hammer and you kind of scratch along the length of their sole. Well, a person who's got brainstem disease will often show an abnormal response, and that abnormal response will be that their big toe will lift up and the remaining toes will spread out, so to speak. And um, that response, again, together with exaggerated deep tendon reflexes, are indicative of subcortical lesions in the brainstem that are uh, commonly associated with vascular dementia. Some other positive neurological signs of disease is a syndrome known as a pseudobulbar uh, palsy that occurs. That's usually accompanied with dysphagia, that is difficulty swallowing or chewing. That also uh, is usually accompanied with the development of slowed and indistinct speech, uh, stiff and plast, uh, spastic tongue. And all these are, again, resulting from uh, a specific type of lesion in the, the brainstem in what's called the cortical bulbar uh, pathway. Uh, 
And that's a very, very classic, uh, if you will, syndrome that is indicative of uh, brain stem disease uh, accompanied by cerebral vascular, uh, if you will, developments. Other positive indicators are gait abnormalities, kind of a bent over posture and shuffling of one's feet, or some weakness in one or more of the extremities that can't be explained by a peripheral neural disease or maybe a pinched nerve uh, in uh, one of the spinal, uh, if you will, roots, uh, so to speak, and is clearly of central origin. So all those things taken together, uh, are necessary, uh, some evidence from those categories are necessary in order to make a, a diagnosis of vascular dementia. Uh, in addition, like uh, all the other dementias, we need to see the symptoms persist in the absence of delirium, that is, that it's a chronic, if irreversible state, not just something that flares up once in a while in these transient uh, episodes, so to speak. So it needs to be chronic and persistent, not just, if you will, a transient type of event. And then finally, in the case of vascular dementia, it, uh, we typically see it follow some stereotypical temporal progression. That is, the onset of the symptoms tends to be abrupt in about 50% of the cases rather than an imperceptible slow change. We typically see abrupt presentation of uh, cognitive symptoms. Uh, and uh, also, if the symptoms start within three months of a stroke event, uh, that's usually something that's kind of telling us that the dementia symptoms are probably of cerebrovascular uh, origin. Then also, one of the things that uh, the textbooks tell us about vascular dementia is that the progressive loss of capabilities tends to happen in these stepwise uh, uh, fashions rather than a continuous gradual decline as we see in this slide here. Uh, the stepwise type of fashion, what we see is a decline and then a, a period of relative stability with uh, no loss and then all of a sudden another stepwise drop in function followed by a plateau, et cetera. That type of progression of disease is thought to be very characteristic of a vascular dementia as opposed to, let's say, the other leading cause of dementia, uh, Alzheimer's disease, which doesn't have these little plateaus. We see a continuous, if you will, ever-present decline of function from the beginning right to the end of uh, the, the disorder. Uh, so there's something that could distinguish between vascular, a signature that could distinguish between vascular dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And let me remind you, as you're watching this, these lectures on vascular dementia and Alzheimer's disease, as a student, one of the things you, you really want to focus on is how can I perhaps distinguish between vascular dementia and Alzheimer's disease? What are some of the unique signatures of each disease and uh, to help you, if you will, to try to be able to distinguish between the two disorders. Now, there is a lot of fuzziness and overlap of symptoms, so to speak, but one of your missions should be to try to distinguish uh, characteristic features of one disease compared to the other. So in here, we're seeing the, the if you will, the stepwise progression of the disorder as opposed to the continuous uh, progression of the disorder. So uh, some uh, additional characteristics of vascular dementia, we already know it's a chronic and irreversible disease and it results from brain, death, uh, brain cell death like all the, of the chronic dementias. And that the mechanism of brain deterioration is primarily due to multiple subcortical infarctions, uh, focal cerebral uh, lesions, and in many cases, diffuse small vessel disease. That is uh, that the very small uh, arteries supplying the brain begin to become diseased and can no longer provide the glucose and other nutrients that the brain needs. And we see sort of uh, the gradual destruction of various aspects of the brain uh, with the concomitant loss of motor skills and cognitive function. And uh, in terms of the age of onset, this is a interesting distinguishing feature from Alzheimer's dementia. In vascular dementia, if you're going to get vascular dementia, the chances are it's going to present itself with the average age of about 66. 
And if you're going to get it, you're going to get it before you're into your mid uh, 70s, so to speak. That's pretty typically the case. So its onset tends to be much earlier than Alzheimer's disease, which we'll see in Alzheimer's. Every year you live past 65, your risk increases until the time you die. Uh, age is a very, 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 very powerful accelerating uh, risk factor with respect to diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and so one of the problems, uh, you know, one of the reasons that vascular dementia occurs earlier is that small vessel disease, if it's going to strike, is going to peak by the seventh uh, decade of, of life. And related to that is about 80% of the people who develop a vascular dementia have a life history, medical history of uh, pretty severe hypertension. Um, here's a little checklist I presented for you. If you were going to, uh, you know, want to sit down and make a diagnosis of a uh, person with uh, vascular dementia, you'd see, oh, gee, yes, do they have a memory loss? And oh, do they, they have to have at least one or more of these uh, cognitive losses? Uh, that yes, it has to affect their social or occupational function. And finally, you need to see some sort of neurological evidence for the, you know, coming from this list showing, uh, you know, relationship to cerebrovascular disease. And then find, uh, and then also that it's not just present in a delirium state. And that checklist, you, you know, you take a look at it after you've gone through it, and you can see if it seems to meet the signature of a vascular dementia. We'll look at a similar type checklist when we get to Alzheimer's disease. A few more uh, characteristics of vascular dementia we need to look at is that in, in terms of its gender distribution, that is, does it affect men versus women, it's twice as likely to occur in men than in women. And as we'll see when we get to Alzheimer's disease, that's a, we see a flip-flop. Alzheimer's disease is just about, your risk of Alzheimer's disease is about twice that of uh, a man's if you happen to be a woman. And uh, so we see that uh, gender distribution reverse itself when we go from vascular dementia where men are more likely than women to in Alzheimer's where women are more likely to get the disorder than men. And a, a, a characteristic of vascular dementia that's important to point out is that as a disease develops, the brain damage tends to be highly localized. That is, instead of the whole cerebral cortex going down all at once, you have some areas of the brain that get involved, but other areas of the brain are spared, particularly in early to mid stages of the, of the disorder. So you get this patchy loss of cognitive function rather than all skills going down simultaneously. So that erratic distribution of cognitive capabilities is kind of a hallmark of this uh, disorder. Uh, in the uh, early stages of the disease, so we look at its uh, clinical progression, uh, the early symptoms are really not very informative. We see dizziness, headaches, some decreased uh, physical and mental vigor, some vague physical complaints. And actually, the reason we know these are the early symptoms is only after people have progressed and developed full-blown dementia, and then we go back and do a little bit of forensic uh, work, and yeah, we can see people were having these vague complaints a year or two before their more severe symptoms began to present uh, themselves. So clearly, those early symptoms are really not diagnostic at all. They could occur due to, for any uh, reasons, not getting enough exercise, a bad diet, et cetera. Uh, but uh, again, one of the uh, important aspects, as we kind of alluded to earlier, uh, a characteristic of this disorder is the onset tends to be sudden, about 50% of the cases. Um, essentially, the, um, so as the small vessel uh, disease uh, you know, increases, we begin to see more cognitive uh, symptoms present themselves and some of the other, if you will, motor symptoms like apraxia, pseudomotor palsy, and then sometimes uh, urinary incontinence as well. As I mentioned also, due to the patchy involvement of cortical loss, the cognitive skills that are lost are erratic and patchy, and we get this stepwise progression of the illness, as we mentioned earlier as well. This leads uh, ultimately to we see general apathy in vascular dementia patients kick in. Uh, and uh, this 
apathy, if you will, seems to occur earlier in vascular dementia patients than in Alzheimer's patients. Compared to Alzheimer's patients, the free recall, the memory of, uh, if you will, vascular dementia patients doesn't seem to be as profoundly affected. They're more likely to maintain good judgment uh, well into their disease process compared to Alzheimer's victims. Unlike Alzheimer's victims, however, they're much more likely to present with hallucinations on occasion and occasional delirium states uh, can uh, occur, these transient sort of, uh, if you will, confusion states that come and go. And uh, in the literature, there is this effect called sundowning uh, that where clinicians with lots of experience working in nursing homes, et cetera, uh, claim that uh, these conditions tend to worsen at night and uh, hence the term sundowning. Uh, I don't know how real that effect is, so to, to speak. You see many people claiming it occurs, but almost as many people claim that they don't see this type of progression as the night goes on. I will tell you that one of the things that's interesting with respect to the onset of nighttime that we're seeing in nursing homes is a little bit more problem with uh, sleep disturbances, et cetera. And if you go to a nursing home, one of the things you'll often see is uh, uh, rooms with very large uh, t screen TVs where people uh, sit and watch TV uh, to keep themselves sort of entertained. And these modern big screen TVs that we all have, uh, have are illuminated with LEDs instead of fluorescent bulbs. And as a result, they have a lot of blue light energy in them, short wavelength light. And that uh, may be actually throwing off the circadian rhythms of uh, older people who are spending a lot of time in front of these screens. And there's uh, some research that's uh, been done uh, recently that suggests by essentially using uh, some filters on these screens to cut down the blue light, it may actually help mitigate some of this disturbance of the circadian rhythm and increase frequency of sleep disorders that people have been documenting in nursing homes as of late. So we'll have to stay tuned to that research to see if uh, it actually uh, is a, a reliable outcome that we can begin to uh, mitigate the effects of some of this modern technology and how it might be disturbing the, the sleep cycles of nursing home residents. In terms of its prognosis and treatment, uh, during the later stages of vasco dementia, you're ultimately going to reach a point where the uh, patient is going to have to be institutionalized. They're going to need round the clock 24 7 care. And many, many, many people can just not provide that care at home, and hence people need to ultimately move into uh, the nursing home. Uh, the survival duration following a, uh, if you will, diagnosis of vascular dementia is typically about three to four years. That's what you could typically expect. There are clearly exceptions to that, but that's the typical value. And uh, one of the characteristics of vascular dementia is because it's based on vascular disease, people often have very, very many additional comorbidities uh, that are associated with cardiovascular disease. And therefore they require lots of pharmacological and perhaps even surgical interventions that Alzheimer's victims might not need uh, because they may or may not have uh, these types of comorbidities. So um, in the final stage of the disorder, uh, the patients, as I said, <coughs> Uh, need to be institutionalized, but also they become bedridden in the terminal phase. They just uh, become so emaciated and so dysfunctional, they need to just stay in bed. And that means, you know, essentially all of their toileting and other types of uh, needs need to be assisted through, uh, if you will, the staff of the institution. And then finally, what we see is the disease ends in the death of the patient, and it's usually due to some cardiovascular event like a heart attack or stroke or maybe some sort of persistent uh, pneumonia. And pneumonia is uh, really an inciting cause in many, many bedridden, emaciated uh, patients, as you might suspect, are spending months in, in a bed that's just not good for uh, our lungs. And uh, that sort of begs an interesting issue for me, you know, 
These days you can get a pneumonia vaccine for that covers maybe 15 types of pneumonia. And uh, <clears throat> I've often wondered myself, I haven't gotten a pneumonia vaccine myself yet, now that I'm uh, over 65 years of age. And I often wonder, gee, do I really want that vaccine? Because if I'm bedridden in a nursing home, I would kind of think that that might not be a bad thing to finally pass away and to be, get you know out of my misery and not be such a burden to my, my loved ones, so to speak. But that's a very difficult thing to think about and to discuss, et cetera. And I certainly haven't made a decision yet about that, but uh, I'm giving it uh, quite serious thought myself. So finally, we can see some uh, risk factors that are associated with dementia uh, of the vascular type. And what you'll see is they're the same risk factors we see for heart disease. You have a fatty diet, you have some lipid metabolism disorders involving high levels of, if you will, bad cholesterol in your bloodstream and high levels of triglycerides, you have a history of smoking, you live in an area with environmental pollution, you have poor aerobic fitness, hypertension, as we saw in 80% of the cases of vascular dementia, hereditary heart disease, all these things, all the risk factors you'd expect for heart disease are the same risk factors you see for cerebrovascular disease and, uh, if you will, vascular dementia. <clears throat> 